Everybody, it's me, Candace, owner of Chubby and Pooh's Mid City Bookshop, here for our Pride Month celebration. We're doing a panel today with some local adult uh, queer authors, which I'm really excited about. We're doing another panel on the 17th, which is going to be children's books. Um, so I'm really excited to celebrate these local authors and Pride Month with you. Um, for those of you who may not know, uh, I am non-binary and I think like four different types of queer. I am the only queer owned bookstore in New Orleans as far as I know. Um, and I'm really excited to celebrate Pride Month today. And so I am going to be talking to three uh, adult authors. Uh, one writes romance and the other two write mystery. And so I'm really excited to discuss genre fiction with them. So I am going to be talking to Greg Heron, who is a New Orleans-based author and editor. He's the co-founder of the Saints and Sinners Literary Festival, which we sell books at every year as well. So I know you know the festival uh, and uh, it, it that takes place here in New Orleans. And he Greg is the author of 33 novels and maybe more now, but at least 33 novels. Um, and he won the Lambda Literary Award. He writes like pretty much everything, adult, young adult, horror, mystery, erotica. Uh, he does a little bit of everything. So I'm excited to talk to Greg today. I am also speaking with Jane Redman, who is the author of the mystery series following the New Orleans private detective, Michelle Mickey Knight. I know uh, at least a few of you have read this series. Um, her 2013 release, Ill Will, made the American Library Association GLBT roundtables over the rainbow list. Her previous book, Watermark, was also on the over the rainbow list, and it won a four-word gold first place mystery award. Two of her earlier books won Lambda Awards. Um, all except her very first book have been nominated for Lambdas. Um, and Law and Desire was also an editor's choice of the San Francisco Chronicle and a recommended book on NPR's Fresh Air. And she is also a co-editor with Greg Heron on, I believe, three anthologies, Night Shadows um, and Women of the Mean Streets and Men of the Mean Streets. Um, and also lives here in New Orleans. And finally, we have Tracy Taylor, who is also here in New Orleans, um, but she also likes to travel the globe searching for new adventures, which I think is really cool. She earned her Bachelor of Arts in International Sociology from Bowling Green State University, and she studied art history in Florence, Italy, and worked as an au pair in Hungary, which is really cool. Tracy completed her graduate degree in museum studies from the HBCU Southern University here in New Orleans while living in the south of France. Um, and her book is called And I You. Greg has actually a new book coming out called Bury Me in Shadows. And Jane's most recent book, I believe, is not dead enough. And they can correct me if I'm wrong on those. So welcome, welcome, Tracy, Greg, and Jane. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, so hopefully I didn't get any of that super wrong. Or <laughs> Um, but tell us to start off a little bit about yourselves and about um, your books, just to try and introduce the audience to who y'all are. So do you want to start off, Tracy, since you're there at the top with me? Sure. Um, let's see. My book is a romantic story, a romantic lesbian story that takes place in Detroit in 1996. And that year was like really special. Everything was still kind of fresh. It's kind of like the, the golden age. So that's why I picked that year. Um, the music was good and it was just life was good then. So it's a, a group of 30 something um, African-American lesbians and it's a different view. Um, they're pretty um, influential and they, they're you know financially secure and it's a different look at um, black life there. Um, the main characters are McCoy and Desiree, and they go through a lot of uh, life situations um, that happen just as being black and gay in America. Um, that's about it. That's all I can think of right now. Perfect. What about you, Jean? 
Okay, uh, well, like you said, uh, Not Dead Enough is my latest book. Um, it is the 10th in the Mickey Knight series. I did have another series that I worked on, I had two books published, and then the publisher decided they were no longer going to um, publish mysteries at all, and I am trying not to be responsible for it, but who knows. Um, yeah, so Mickey Knight is, uh, I started out, the first book was published in 1990. Yeah, I'm that old. Um, and I was reading some of the other books um, at the time that um, uh, Sarah Paretsky, Sue Grafton, Marsha Muller, they were doing the female PIs. And then there's also the, the, the burgeoning of the lesbian movement, you know, in the, in the mid 80s and stuff. Um, Barbara Wilson starting off with Murder and Collective, Catherine Forrest with Murder at the Nightwood Barns. And it's like, okay, these are the books I want, I like to read, and I want to read a lesbian detective. And there were a few authors, I don't want to say there weren't any, because that would be not true. And But I just wanted to read something a little bit edgier, something a little bit more hard-boiled. I thought, well, maybe I need to write that book. And so I said, okay, what the hell, I did. Um, with no real plans for, it's going to be a series, it's going to be, I'm still going to be writing it in my dotage, um, that sort of stuff. Um, but I, the character is a bit edgy. Uh, like I say, it's fairly noir. Um, you know, you see some of the areas of New Orleans that the tourists don't see. Um, and I'm still kind of, you know, I'm still interested in the character. She's still got stuff going on in her life. Um, and so I'll just keep keep writing it until I, uh, you know, well, until I die or I get tired of it. That sounds good. What about you, Greg? Yeah, um, I've written a lot. Like you said, I don't know. I don't know how many books I've actually written. I, whenever somebody asks me, I have to count, and I always forget some. So I'm always it's it's always wrong. I'm kind of a compulsive, obsessive compulsive writer. I write all the time, though I'm not really in a good writing groove right now. But yeah, I a lot of this. I've always been writing ever since I was a kid. You know, my parents thought I was well. They still think I'm weird, but. When I was a kid, I used to, people used to make, my mom and dad and my sister thought it was really strange because they thought I played with my sister's dolls, but I wasn't really playing with dolls. I was telling stories and there were characters in my stories, but I guess I kind of was, I guess that is what playing with dolls kind of is about. But they thought, you know, in the 1960s, because I, yes, I am that old, that was not, you know, boys don't do that. <laughs> And I always got a lot of pushback. I always thought that maybe the reason that my parents thought I was weird was because I was, they didn't understand what it was like to have a gay kid. But now I realize as an adult that, well, I was an artistic kid and that was completely out of their realm of experience. So the double whammy, <laughs> I, I, I was joking with them. I just visited my parents recently and I told them I was going to put on my Tombstone is going to read, I finally stopped disappointing my parents. So, yeah, and my next book is a is a ghost, it's kind of a ghost story, gothic thing that I wrote. I've had the idea for a long time. It's um, based on an old family legend, which is probably a lie, because we're from Alabama, and all stories from that time are not true, really, in a, in a way. Um, like... My grandmother used to, I, when I was a kid, my grandmother used to tell me all these family history stories. And it wasn't until I was much older that I realized like the story about the Yankee soldier and all of that crap is like, that's apocryphal. That story is everywhere. Everyone has the story of the evil Yankee soldier who crept up on the house to rob them. And then the, and the lady of the house killed him. I mean, it's even in Gone with the Wind. So I kind of, but I've always wanted to write this one story about the kids who disappeared, the boys who disappeared during the Civil War. And it's set there, it's dealt with a lot of, had me dealing with a lot of family stuff. So hopefully people will like it. If they won't, I'll, I'm sure I'll find out soon enough by looking at Goodreads when it comes out. <laughs> you so Goodreads will always tell you how they feel. <laughs> Oh, I, I suggest you just not looking at Goodreads, Greg. <laughs> yeah, I don't look at Goodreads. Yeah. Not enough time yeah. in the day. Nah, it's not worth it. Um, so tell us, and whoever wants to go can go, what got y'all into writing genre fiction versus 
you know, literary or any anything else that you could write? Because Tracy writes romance um, and Greg and Jane write mysteries. So why genre? Oh, to make all the money. <laughs> no. Yeah, right. You know, that, that is totally sarcasm font because I still have a day job. Um, for me, mysteries, you know, and, and I've said this before, so it's Greg will be bored, but, you know, the genres in some ways speak very much to the things that we as humans need the most. Uh, romance is about love and connection and finding people. Science fiction is about what's the future, what does it, it hold, where will we go as, as people. Um, and mysteries are about justice. You know, how do we find justice? How do we, um, you know, search for uh, in a chaotic world where often we don't know the truth? Mysteries actually give us you know, we know who the bad guys are. We know who the good guys are. And sometimes, you know, life just doesn't give us that. Um, and I think for, for me, one of the things that um, is interesting for, you know, for all of us is, is taking these genres that have been, um, you know, that, that there, uh, you know, so much of that was, you know, it, you know, the hard boiled detective was, was pretty much male. And then the women started to say, no, 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 they can be that. And then to say, no, it can be a lesbian, it can be a gay man, or that we can be the heroes of these stories. For mysteries, it's we can be the ones who decide what is good, what is evil, and we can be the heroes in a way that gay people were never allowed to be. With romance, it's like we can find love again. We can be the main protagonist. We can be the ones who deserve love. And I think that's one of the reasons um, for particularly LGBTQ people to take over genres because we deserve to have those stories too and we deserve that space. With mine uh, being a romance, um, it kind of wrote itself. Uh, I went to a party and after the party, I went home and I just started writing right after the party. And like every day had a, a, a job also. Every day I would go home and I would write a little bit more and the, the uh, characters just created themselves as I was reading like Susan Grafton and the thing. So there's no murder mystery in this one, but my follow-up book is. And it just, um, it's so important to have love and it's so important to see it. I know when I was young in my early 20s, um, there was very few books that I connected with, being Black, being gay. There was very few books that I connected with. There was a lot of romance and there was a lot of, um, you know, just books. So I wanted to get this one out, not only for like my daughter's 27, so people in her age group will know that it's okay to be gay. This is a different time. Be open, be yourself. So that's why I wanted to make sure it came out now versus, um, it's all about timing and it's the perfect time for um, this book to come out. Well, for me, I always liked my grand. It was the grandmother who would always tell me the phony family history, as I like to refer to it now. She was really into movies and she was really into reading, obviously. <laughs> she liked to make up stories too, apparently. But her favorite, her favorite movies were the old black and white crime movies, the noirs, the Barbara Stanwyck, you know, those type things. And she also liked what... And to this day, I still, I don't really, in my head, I don't think of it as horror. I just think of it as scary stories because that's what she called them. They were scary movies. So when I, so she, like she warped me when I was very young. So I'm like watching Sorry, Wrong Number and Double Indemnity and The Haunting when I'm seven years old. <laughs> and then, so when I gravitated towards reading, I also gravitated to those types of stories that I was reading. So I read all the mysteries and all of the, started reading there wasn't I didn't read so much so much horror because I didn't Dracula and Frankenstein to me I mean they're classics of the horror genre and obviously they've influenced all the everything that's come since them but they're not really horror in the sense of what horror is today they're very literate Dracula is epistolary it's all written in letters and diary entries Frankenstein is very philosophical the monster is nothing like he is in movies or on television he's actually speaks and is very intelligent and he, he argues with his maker of these great philosophical questions so for a nine-year-old <laughs> that didn't really he's like no no I don't want to read that and so I was reading the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew, then Agatha Christie, Ellery Queen, and so on and so forth. And then I went through a romance period. My favorites 
I love romantic suspense. So when I was a teenager, I was like reading Daphne du Maurier and Victoria Holt and Phyllis Whitney and Mary Stewart. Mary Stewart is hilarious because her books are actually mostly about the crime and about the mystery. And then she just throws in a little bit of romance so that they, they would get published and they would give her a romantic cover and they would sell. And she even would say that. She's like, my books aren't really about the romance at all, but that's what we need to sell the books. And I've never really written romance, but I've always wanted to try writing a romance novel. Nevada Barr said that if it's not romance or mystery, it's just boring. <laughs> I think she kind of has a point there. I, I don't like, I've never really, I mean, I can appreciate literary fiction. I can appreciate beautiful sentence structure and all of all of the, th the symbolism. I can appreciate all of that. But usually literary fiction, and I'm going to get raked over the coals for saying this, but literary fiction is usually about people I don't want to know. <laughs> it's like, I don't, I don't really want to read another story about the sad middle-class existence in some suburb in the middle of nowhere. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't care that, to read about that. I, I lived that experience when I was a kid growing up. I don't, I don't really care about the plight of the straight white man. I, I mean, really, oh, it's so rough being you. <laughs> But <laughs> that's yeah. the best quote. I don't care about the plight of the straight white man. I, it's, it's just like, yes, put that on yeah, a billboard, please. I'm gonna get in a lot of trouble now, I guess. But <laughs> but I think that like yeah. like Jean's like Gina Tracy said, it's like the genre is a really great place to explore a lot of things about being queer, where how we interact with the world. We're out. Queer people are still outsiders, and it's the outsiders who view the inside with a much clearer eye than the people that are on the inside. And especially, and and I think that I've always felt that I really believe that people of color and pe queer people are reinvigorating our publishing world. It was getting stale. And just like as Jean pointed out, the crime fiction world in the 1970s was so tired and so boring because it was the same thing over and over and over again. And then the women came along and gave it a shot in the arm and brought it all back into, you know, into what it is today, which is a really diverse, amazing, broad spectrum of voices and stories. And I think, and I see that in romance as well. Um, I, I follow a lot of romance writers on Twitter because Twitter romance, is, <laughs> romance landia on Twitter is so entertaining. <laughs> There's always something fun going on in romance landia, and I see and I see a lot of I see a lot of and I've picked up a lot of stuff off of there. You know, authors that I might not have found before that are getting a, getting their place at the table finally. And it's great to see, and I hope it continues going forward. I hope it's not just a passing thing and then publishers are gonna decide, eh, no, no, you just need the white straight people again. No, I hope that doesn't happen. But I don't think, I don't think we're in a place, you know, as a country and as a culture and as a society where that, the silent, the great silent, well, you know, or we could turn into the Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think Never it's know. always going to be this this constant churning. I mean, Greg, you and I uh, went through the the mid '90s. Oh my God, LGBTQ! It's the greatest thing. All the big publishers wanted LGBTQ, and uh, we were published by them, and then we didn't sell books uh, because the the mainstream audience wasn't ready to you know, willing to buy books. I remember one books, a friend of mine telling me a bookseller, um, I was published by W.W. W. Norton. So, okay. I was respectable press, quote unquote, um, went to a bookstore and the guy had a big display in New Orleans. This was not in New Orleans, obviously. And she said, Oh, my friend, so-and-so a straight woman, well, quote credit to her said, Oh, my friend just had this book come out. My, my third book, intersection of law and desire. It's about New Orleans. You should have it in your display. And the good bookseller said, Oh, I can't have that book in that display. It wouldn't fit because you know, at that point, the, the books were, it wasn't a book about New Orleans. It wasn't a book about a private eye. It was a book about a lesbian. And that, because of that identity, that was all it could be, you know, and that, that struggle through that period. And I, I do agree. I do think, you know, the optimistic me that, that every once in a while uh, pops up, 
out of the cynical depths um, that things are changing. I know there's been huge pushes but in, in the mystery genre, and I think in the romance genre too, of um, Mystery Writers of America, Sisters in Crime, have had a lot more diversity um, uh, panels, a lot more pushing for real diversity, not just, you know, fortunately we've gotten past the, oh, diversity, we'll have a panel of gay writers, we'll have a panel of African-American writers. It's like, no, I write um, detective fiction. I should be on the detective fiction panel. You know, period. Greg should be on the um, the humorous mystery panel. Um, you know, because those are the kind of mysteries we write. Stop focusing on the sex because that's not it. You know, we don't group people by heterosexuality. Um, yeah, so I think maybe it is changing. Maybe we're finally getting to a tipping point where everybody gets to be human, not just certain people. But I, I, I also think that given the politics going on now, it's going to be a huge monumental struggle. Yeah, I yeah. totally agree. I see the same sort of things happening in science fiction and fantasy, which is, you know, my specialty where um, there's been this like revolution injection. It was also getting really stale. Like Greg said, it was all the same story where you have this hero's journey. And, and it's so funny because I get in trouble too, because I say like, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, like it's all the same story. It's literally the same. Uh, it takes place in different worlds maybe, but it's all the same story. And it's like, this is what fantasy is, right? Like the the male hero gets a quest from an old wizard that he then has to go on and he collects sidekicks and like they might have some fights and stuff. There's maybe a romance in there and then he saves the world. The end, like that's every story. And so it's been really cool to see so many different people um, of different like backgrounds and cultures and things like that, like just come in and start telling all of these stories and using storytelling, you know, from not the West, right? Like it's also like really cool to see story structures and things like that, that are just totally different from what we've seen for so long. And I, I do hope that that keeps going as well, because it's, it's really cool. Like I'm, I'm really excited about like all all the books in all the genre fiction, you know, like romance is doing the same thing. There's like so much diverse, different romance and mystery. So I think genre is like where it's at for me, where, where you can like get all of these perspectives and you can, you know, to me, genre is more, you can tell a truth that's bigger than real life. Um, you can, you can comment on something in a way that you can't really do when you're telling a real life story. So that's that's my genre soapbox. <laughs> well, uh, literary fiction is genre too. It's oh, got its conventions. Yeah. You no, know, and anyone who's like, oh, well, literary fiction is like, no, it's got its same little conventions and stuff. So don't get all snobby on us. And you can have incredible writing. And I think some of the most brilliant writing can come out of you know science fiction, romance. You know, and romance gets kicked because it's considered the women's uh, genre. And of course, everything that's women's gets kicked down, which is also unfair. Um, but there's really some incredible writing. And let's face it, you know, one of the, the best books out there is Pride and Prejudice. What is it? It's a romance. Hello. Exactly. I think you're right. People look down on genre in general, but I think romance and Tracy can speak to this specifically. It like gets totally just, I mean, I think it's getting a little bit better than it used to be, but like, it's still like, oh, that's trash, right? Like, oh, are you, you're just reading this trash book. And it's not like there's some such good romance. So why don't you comment a little on that, Tracy? Um, yes, romance is like when you think of romance, you think of like I guess the Harlequins with the picture on the front and things like that. And you're like, oh, just being swept away on a ship or desert or something. the same romantic story over and over again. But um, romance is this one. My romance um, is a, li a, a little different because there's a lot of philosophical questions in there. It's it's very light reading and it's easy reading. Reading, but once you get into it, uh, there's a situation about abortion and uh, Roe versus Wade is in there and there's a group of women who have a discussion about it. So although the overall book is romance, there's a lot of good topics. There's a uh, rape scenes, uh, a rape scene in there. And then the philo 
uh, the philosophical discussion of, you know, what to do with a child after you've been raped. And there's, it's more than just, you know, love, you know, love, love, love. There's um, real discussions that can be addressed. There's a um, married couple in there and there are two men that live in New York and just one's on Broadway, one's in, you know, Wall Street, basically. Um, and what it's like to be like, just a normal couple in New York in the 90s that just happened to be black and they just happened to be gay. So it's more than just romance, it's actual life and how we deal with life. Nothing is, you know, just fluffy and sugary and powdery. You know, it's life is real and you have to deal with different situations um, when you're dealing with it. Hopefully you can find the romance or the optimum, you know, be optimistic about what's happening. But um, yeah, romance gets, it has a bad rap from, 20, 30 years ago. The funny thing to me about it is like, originally all fiction was romance. All the great King Arthur is a romance. <laughs> the Canterbury Tales are romances. Romance is always supposedly, has always been this epic story about humanity and love and life and death and so on and so forth. You know, they considered back in the 19th century, Alexander Dumas' work was considered, they were romances. And somehow that got pared down to just being simply, oh, it's just a little love story. It's just a little love story. It's about two people falling in love and going through obstacles and finding the end. It's like, no, romance is actually the human experience and all the great human questions. And I get really irritated, really, really irritated when people when people put down romance, because I may not write it, but I understand it and I understand the need for it. And I think there is a lot of sexism with that because romance is seen as books by women about women for women. So therefore it's not worth anything. And it's like, well, I'm so sorry, but some of the greatest writers of all time are women. Sorry, get used to it, get over it and get used to it. And some of the best writers we have now across all genres, including the literary genre, are women. Some of the best crime writing, crime writers of the 40s, 50s, and 60s were women, but we don't ever hear about them. We hear about the men who wrote in those that time period, but there were also a lot of great women. John Ross MacDonald is one of the great mystery writers of all time. His wife was more successful than he was. He was married to Margaret Millar. His real name is Kenneth Millar. She was so much more successful than he is. He had to use a pen name, but we don't remember or talk about her today. So he couldn't even use his own name because his wife had, had taken the brand. But women can't yeah. write. <laughs> well, and, and look at you know how many times, you know, the people, you know, women weren't educated. Uh, African Americans weren't educated. What did society do to make sure those voices were silenced? You know, so that that the quote unquote great male write, uh, writers are the are the can so called canon is men. Well, why? Because they were the only ones that were able to do it. They're the only ones that got the privilege and the time. So how many voices have we lost? And we finally, finally allowing to say, you know, you too are valuable and you too are human, uh, human enough that we should hear hear the voices. And I think that's one of the struggles that we're, we're still engaging in, certainly as writers, we're part of that, being able to say we have stories, we have the right to tell stories, we have the right to be part of this conversation. Um, and I, I think, you know, it, it's frustrating, you know, it, like Greg said, you know, that, that so many of the writers, you know, despite everything thrown uh, against them, you know, I like to remind people that, hey, Mary Shelley invented both science fiction and horror, um, you know, two genres in one, you know, what, what, what was she, 19 or something? Just, you know, totally, totally uh, dispiriting if you're over 25. Um, you know, but, but we've lost so much because we didn't hear those voices. And I think, too, that one of the things is that people can see their lives, but those of us who live what I call the, the dominant culture and subdominant culture. So if you're um, if you're a straight white male, particularly, you live in that particular dominant culture. 
And if you're a woman, you live in the, the straight white male dominant culture because you have to, but there's also some women's culture. If you're African-American, there's a whole different culture that you're part of that the straight white people may not be at all aware of. The same thing if you're LGBTQ, um, people may not be aware of your culture, but because you live in those multiple cultures, you have a much broader view of the world than the people that just live in the one of the cultures. Yeah, I love this so much. Tracy, go ahead. And I I love the way that um, Jean just said that the, the uh, books also need to cross over as well. Um, you're not in a box. I mean, we're in these little boxes here, but you don't live in a box and you can be, you know, uh, black, you can be gay, you can be straight, you can be, you know, in these different boxes and one book should not make you stay in that box or that's that's the only thing it is. So I think it's very important that we cross uh, cross the cultures in the book. So it's not just the straight white voice or just the black uh, male voice or just the female voice. Um, when I, my favorite authors, uh, of course, you know, Maya Angelou, Nikki Giovanni, they're the canons of black literature, of course, but you're more than just that one thing. And the stories need to be told in a different view. There's so many books, um, 12 Years a Slave. There's so much more than just that one view from being Black, and it's so important that more stories are told. That's all. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think these the intersections of things are so important, and I think that so many times the intersections are just completely overlooked. Like, you, the people do try to put you in, and I see it, like, as a bookseller in the industry, big publishers trying to put writers into boxes and using things like own voices, which was started as a reader hashtag to help readers find books. And publishers have just completely destroyed that whole thing, which is really sad. Um, and like, are, is trying to use it as a marketing thing and to like force writers into voices. I've heard horror stories about queer writers, you know, publishers wanting them basically to out themselves so that they could sell a book as own voices. Um, and that's, you know, it's like, that's, that is not the way to go. Like, I, you know, we, we need to see more stories and intersections and like it, stop trying to put it into a box. Like Tracy was saying, it's not just a queer story. There's so much more happening. And I also see all these authors getting super attacked because they're a queer author, but their books aren't queer enough. Like this is what they're saying, right? That it's like, oh, uh, like Aiden Thomas, I think just got like destroyed for his second book, which he wrote Cemetery Boys. And then his set, which is like a trans story. And then his second book, Lost in the Neverwoods, is just like a Peter Pan retelling and it's super fun and great. And people are like, well, there's no queer stuff in the, like, okay. Like queer writers don't have to just write about being queer. It's like, people want that trauma. I feel like it's the same with black writers, right? Like they want like, well, where's the black stuff? Where's the trauma? And it's like, we're, all of us are more than that. Right. I, well, the, I think that I always thought that the Lost Boys were kind of coded anyway. <laughs> I mean, oh, they're but, totally like, gay, like a hundred percent. Totally gay, totally, totally gay. I mean, I know so many of them. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and yeah, and there's so many, as Gene was saying, and Tracy was saying, there's so many, the boxes and so on and so forth, and there's so many voices that we've lost. Where are all the great romance, historical romance stories of the free people of color in New Orleans? That's an entire culture, a huge, huge part of the fabric of the city. No one writes about it. Those books aren't there. You can't find them anywhere. Maybe there are some. Um, but I know I, the only ones that I've read were written by white women, unfortunately. You know, Anne Rice did uh, Feast of All Saints and Barbara Hambly did that wonderful crime series with Benjamin January. But I've always been fascinated fascinated by that and I've always wanted I've kind of always wanted to write about it but I don't know that it's my place to write about it but I didn't I wasn't aware that Aiden Thomas had gotten the grief about that second book I guess I missed that on YA Twitter I guess that would be but it I get very irritated when people try to decide what what's queer enough and what's not queer enough like there was that horrible article and horrible column in the New York Times about Mayor Pete by, by a gay, white gay male writer 
who didn't think we could trust him because he wasn't queer and he wasn't gay enough. And it's like, I beg your pardon. There are gays who live outside of New York city. There's a lot of us actually. The reason I started writing my, and I, now I remember the reason why I started writing my story, my, my gay mysteries in new Orleans was because there were no gay male stories being written about new Orleans, which has a huge gay has always had a big gay community and has always had a, a big drag community, if nothing else, New Orleans, New York. I mean, it, I belong to several Facebook groups about old New Orleans, past New Orleans, or ain't there no more New Orleans and things like that. And you are always finding pictures of men in drag going back to the tent, the teens, the twenties, the thirties. It, it goes back a very long way. And I really find it hard to believe that some of those men weren't a little not so much on the straight side. And oh, a lot, yeah. <laughs> and there were gay bars in the quarter going back to the 19th century. That's what I wrote about in my Sherlock Holmes story. I wrote, and that was, a, it was set during this, right before the, our entry into the First World War. But, you know, New Orleans is such a great city to write about because you never run out of material here. There's always something new. There's always, you're always fine. I've lived here for 26 years and I don't think I could ever scratch the surface of everything there is to know or learn or see or know about the city. It's, it, it's like, yeah, I've written, I don't know, 20, 30 books set in New Orleans. I haven't even scratched the surface of the city at all. And there's so many, so many different cultures and so many different people and so many different waves of immigrants. And New Orleans is just, I love New Orleans. I, you know, for me, New Orleans is it. I could never live anywhere else. And hopefully I won't get priced out. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Yeah. Well, and it's true. I mean, New Orleans is this, this fascinating intersection of a city with multiple things. And like you, I felt like, okay, I'm seeing all these lesbians that are in either Los Angeles, San Francisco, or New York. And where are a the southern lesbians? Where is the New Orleans lesbian? And of course, growing up, I grew up in the in the South. Um, I did get up to New York for a while, um, but so I felt like okay, I need to set a book in in New Orleans, and that's that's what I did um, because a it is a fascinating city. You can you literally can walk down the street and run into voodoo rituals. You literally can. There's always a second line going by. There's you know, it's an incredible city in terms of its history, in terms of the intersections of stuff. If you start really looking at, you know, um, the, the the whole French influence, if you realize that the French didn't care what you did, they just wanted to know how to tax it. Selling liquor, fine. Selling drugs, fine. No problem. We just want to tax it. You know, you go right ahead. Coffee shops, coffee shops, they want coffee shops. Um, but it, it's it's fascinating as opposed to the rest of the country where the moral reformers got hold. New Orleans escaped that, and it just leads to a whole different kind of city. And I think particularly for a, a crime city, uh, writing about mystery fiction and stuff, it just makes so much sense to put the books here. Um, and you know, I'm sort of glad, glad that Greg and I have been this little little factory of queer crime here in New Orleans. Uh, maybe someday someone will actually recognize us, but you know, in the meantime, we'll just keep writing. And Tracy, I know your book takes place in Detroit, um, but are, do you plan to write in New Orleans or does New Orleans have any sort of like influence on your writing in any way? Oh, definitely. I did the book in New York. Uh, I wrote my book from the Detroit point of view because like you said, um, the gay, people were known to be in New York or, you know, San Francisco. So I wanted a Midwest, you know, hardy cornfields in the backyard. You can be gay wherever you are. You don't have to be in one of these pockets. So that's why it takes place in uh, Detroit. Um, yes, New Orleans will play a part. The next book I'm writing is a Vera Black. Uh, it's a, she's an international murderess. She tries to find love and when they don't, marry her they accidentally die you know some way so right now she's actually in new orleans and she's working with voodoo so that's that's it's going to take place here this next section is here in new orleans but i did uh when i first got back to got to new orleans i started writing about free people of color and i took it i was in grad school and i took it to my um academic advisor and i did a presentation on it and the reception was so cold 
it was so it's they didn't want to hear that part the the uh, contributions that free people of color made, like just owning businesses and owning, you know, newspapers. And um, I was working with the Free People of Color Museum, um, the McKinnons, and they gave me all of this information. But when I took it to class and I gave the presentation, it did not receive a warm welcome. So I do believe more um, stories should be told from this point of view, from this, from this uh, genre. Uh, I also mask. Uh, I, work, I mask with the Mardi Gras Indians, uh, Skull and Bones, uh, three hundred years, three hundred years old. Uh, yeah, Skull and Bones is three hundred years old, but I'm part of the Mystic Seven Sisters, so we're the ones that go out at four thirty in the morning and carry the lanterns so the Skull and Bones can come uh, through Treme. And stories need to be told. My uh, grandmother in the 1920s and 30s was a uh, Seven Sisters of Algiers. And I didn't know that. I just happened to have a picture of me masking and I sent it to my father. And he told me then at the age of 50 that my grandmother used to do it. So our stories are just not told. There's so many stories that, are, that um, you know, from the, the rich, rich history of New Orleans, the from the quads to the mulattoes, everything. It just needs to be, it needs to be put out there and it needs to be put out there in a respectful way from um, the, the narrative where it's not in a box or it's not, um, there's so many things unexpected that did happen that those things need to be um, put in the forefront. Oh and yeah, it's such a rich, rich culture and history. Yeah, you, you gotta write that book. You, yeah, you got so you gotta write some more books. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Do it. This this uh this accidental death book sounds amazing. Accidental, right? <laughs> like oh yes. Oh my god, I love it. I love the idea. Yeah, there's just there's like I can give you an example. She goes to San Fran, um, Niagara Falls, and she finds out that she's not gonna get married. So she goes to take his picture, and she keeps telling him step back, step back, and you know. He just slides over the fall. There's always in Venice, he gets hit by a gondola, you know, in Spain, he falls into a manhole or something. They're just these, all these accidental deaths soon as he can't, soon as the main character can't get married. So. Love it. You know, that reminds me of, um, if y'all have ever been to Disney World in the Haunted Mansion, there's a ghost like that in, in the Haunted Mansion in Disney World where there's like, there's this whole scene where there's this woman and she keeps getting married and like the the husbands in the in like the marriage photos keep like disappearing as you as you like ride along and so it just it reminds me of that and i love that <laughs> um so if anyone that is watching has questions um feel free to throw them in the chat we have five or six more minutes i i said 45 minutes we've been talking for a while which is awesome this has been a really cool conversation um and uh, you know as Jane and Greg know, like we could all talk all day long. Uh, <laughs> we've, we've done this so many times, we could just keep talking. Um, my dogs had to go outside, so sorry about that. <laughs> they, they were barking. Uh, but yes, if anybody has any specific questions, you can ask. I think we did have one question from Keith, who said, have any of you thought about adapting your books into TV or film? Uh, it's not up to us, unfortunately. It's up to the people with the money to adapt them into TV or film to say, hey, I want to make a movie or a TV show out of your book, and I'm going to be able to do this and, and pay you for it. You know, I could write a script, but it's, it's you know, who's, who's going to do it? So if you know any uh, rich producers, just send them our way. Well, the Scotty series actually was optioned once for a uh television series when Queer as Folk was really popular. They, the producer, the production company thought it would be really fun to do a New Orleans kind of Queer as Folk, only it was only what with crime solving, you know, murder mysteries and so on and so forth. Nothing ever came of it, but it was nice getting that check every quarter while they held the option for two years. That was really, I do miss that. I, I think it would be great. I wouldn't, to it. I don't know that I'd want to be heavily involved. Um, I know I have friends who have adapted their books and have worked written for television and so on and so forth. And it seems like it's an incredibly 
it's a lot of work, <laughs> a lot more work than I'm willing to do. But the pay is really good. But um, it's never, it's not, it's, it's, for me, it's just writing for television, writing for, for screen has never really been something I've ever really thought about or really wanted to do. I mean, if somebody's going to throw a lot of money my way, you know, I'll, I'll write anything if you pay me. So, hello, I'm right here. But, um, yeah, I think the new Queerest Folk is actually going to be set in New Orleans. That's going to be interesting to watch when they reboot it and have it set in New Orleans. We'll see how that goes. And that's the ultimate goal of my book here is to be um, a TV show, to be something on, whether it be Netflix. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, we didn't have like the Tyler Perry's or the Oprah, you know, the Harpo Studios. We have so many Black directors and writers and producers and like they've colored the the uh, Oscars. So it's not just like the white Oscars anymore. So I think as a um, African-American writer, now is the time to push forward, not just the books, but just to just saturate all forms of media, records, uh, TV, movies, just books, everything. So the goal is to get this one into a, um, like a Netflix type thing, done by Tyler Perry or some other black producer. So yeah, that's, as a matter of fact, it's already in screenplay form. I just need that rich person to say, hey, we need it. And I'm gonna just say it, it's already in a box ready to go. Do it, put it out there. Tyler yes. Perry will cover this book, right? <laughs> that would be awesome. Well, I do wanna do quickly um, at the end, a very quick, like just lightning round where I throw a thing out there and y'all just quickly answer with like a couple words. Cause I think these are super fun. It's not anything super that's like gonna mind blow you. It's very simple, but it's always super fun to do. Um, so let's start with, are you a plotter or a pantser? One or the other. You don't have to explain what oh. is plotter or pantser. Oh, pantser, totally. Pantser. Greg, oh wait, you're muted. Hold on, Greg, you're on mute. I'm clicking on the wrong thing. Technology is not my forte. I, it depends on the book for me. All okay. the chance books were extremely plotted out. Um, the Scotty books just happened. Okay, next one. Favorite book <laughs> as a child. For me, it was Encyclopedia Brown series. <laughs> oh, Trixie Belden. Oh, I love Trixie Belden too. Three Investigators. Nice. So, what is a book, if if uh, a book that you faked reading? Faked reading. Mm. Like you uh, tell people you've read, but you haven't really read, or you in the past, like you've told people you read but haven't read. Tracy. Toni Morrison, like the whole collection. <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, actually, I actually read Moby Dick, and I read Moby Dick because when I was in my twenties, I worked in theater in New York, and I ended up being the master electrician on a, a show that was a hit. So every single night in the theater, I had to watch that same show over and over again, or else I could read. I would read like one book like Moby Dick or, you know, Middlemarch into the lighting booth with me. And so I would have to read that book because I was so fucking bored with the play. I have never actually read, I have lied, I've never actually read and I have lied about it. I've never read Huckleberry Finn. <laughs> uh, what is a book that you're just like an evangelist for? You love it and you tell everyone about it. Oh, Greg Heron, of course. <laughs> oh, now I have to say Gene Redman, don't I? <laughs> no, you don't. Of course not. I'm just saying. Yes, exactly. All right, got it. So what is a book that you bought just for the cover? Ooh. Hmm. Um, oh, um, the Lord won't mind. <laughs> it was the first book I ever saw that had 
men touching each other? For me, anything with uh, Leonardo da Vinci on it, anything that has an Italian Renaissance cover, I just purchased a book. I'm so jealous you got to live in Florence. It's my favorite place. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of anything. I can tell you a book that I bought for the store knowing absolutely nothing about it. Just, I was like, yeah, I think I can sell that. <laughs> I, I haven't sold as many copies as I thought, but uh, it's, a, it's a poetry collection um, and it's called Embodied and the cover of that book, it's just like people of every shape, size, color, like everything you can think of essentially having an orgy on the cover of this book. And I was like, oh. yes, I love this so much. And it's not sexual though, but it's just like. Ah, she locked up. Yep. She got so excited she froze. Yeah. Oh my god. Oh my god. We lost her. We lost her. Ah, uh, technology. Okay, well, we'll talk about Italy until she <laughs> Oh God. How long were you in Florence? I lived in Italy two years, Hungary a year, and ah! uh, sorry y'all. I, I don't know what's going on. It <laughs> I yeah, talked about sex. They froze you out. And I think it's a connection. Yeah. Yeah. About that. But yeah, uh, there she is. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, one more. A book you wish you could read again for the first time. Rebecca. Mm. Uh, I think Pride and Prejudice. For me, it's my uh, human revolution. I'm a Nietzsche and Buddhist, and if I can just, the feeling I got the first time I read one, I just would love to continue to be reading this over and over again. Awesome, and Nancy has an interesting question. Um, for those in the audience, Nancy actually edited Tracy's book and is the person who's on the cover, I believe, right? That's Nancy? Yes. Uh, so this is Nancy. If you could rewrite a classic book, what would it be? That's an uh, interesting question. I actually kind of did that already. Oh, yeah, you did. did. Yeah, you did. Yeah. But if if I could re and if I could do it again, I would love to rewrite the Haunting of Hill House. Hmm. Hmm. I would like to rewrite something by um, Mark Twain. Because um, I he had an interesting look at Europe and an interesting look at so I really would like to rewrite some of his from a different view. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would love to take some you know, like like Mark Twain or someone like that and look at it from the other side. Yeah, the people that were just his, his characters that weren't him. I think that'd be fascinating. It would be um, interesting. It would be interesting to read Huckleberry Finn from Jim's point of view. Yes, yes, it would. <laughs> it definitely actually, would. I would actually read that. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thank you all so much for this panel. This was such an interesting discussion, as I know it always is with you lovely people. So thank you so, so much for being here. And um, just because this is my job, <laughs> Everyone should go buy all of these books <laughs> uh, from Tubby and Coos, uh, because if you're watching this, uh, this is Tubby and Coos. Well, I'm not at Tubby and Coos. I'm at my house, um, but <laughs> Tubby and Coos Mid City Bookshop is who I represent. So uh, you can go to tubbyandcoos.com and click on place order and order really any book that you want, but hopefully you will be going there to order any of these books. And Tracy's book in the background there is And I You. Um, and Greg's book is Bury Me in Shadows, which is coming out. When does that come out, Greg? October. October. So you can pre-order that one. Thank and then you. Jane's newest <laughs> book is Not Dead Enough. Um, but I, Jane and Greg both have like a bajillion books. So if you go look them up, I'm sure if you're not interested in those, that there will be something because they've written a lot of stuff. So, uh, and I'm so excited to have Tracy writing stuff now. I'm really excited about your next book. It sounds awesome. Yes, sounds um, awesome. 
Yeah. So yeah, excited for that. So yes, please buy books and thank y'all so much for being here and thank everyone for watching. There have been people watching, so at least there's <laughs> yeah. good. Well, thank, thank you, you Candace. Thanks, of Candace. Course. Yes. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah.